Board of Public Works, they have been going to every ward to do these presentations. This is a big issue because it's money coming out of our taxpayers again. I am hoping that in all these hearings and what we hear from all the residents, our taxpayers, of a good compromise that we can make on this yearly fee. It is mandated, so this fee will definitely be put in place when I cannot answer to that. But I want to acknowledge our council president, Bill Dwight, um, Ned Huntley, the director of the Board of Public Works, Mike Parsons, who is on the board, and Jim Lorello, who is the assistant with Ned Huntley. So, whoever, Jack or Mike. Well, I'm going to try to speak without the microphone. Can everyone hear? You can hear. It is amplified. It is amplified. So, as Marianne said, my name is Mike Parsons. Uh, I'm on the Board of Public Works. I've been on for about five years or so. Uh, I live here in Ward 6, and I've been asked to uh, put on this presentation this evening. What we hope to accomplish in very broad terms is to give you an understanding of how we've gotten to where we are today, uh, give you an understanding of how, um, uh, how broad our responsibilities are in the area of stormwater and flood control, and, and then give you also an understanding of the makeup of the proposed ordinance and as it sits in front of the city council today. So we'll be talking about both the stormwater system in the city and the flood control system. We'll be talking about them separately. They're both regulated by separate federal agencies, so, and that's another reason why we keep them separate. We'll be talking about the need for more funding. All of these new federal requirements are going to result in a requirement for more work by the city, and that means more money. As I said, there's a sample, there's a proposed ordinance uh, that's been submitted to the City Council, it's under review by the City Council, and that's what led to the board meetings like this one tonight. We're going to talk about the ordinance. And then, if the ordinance is passed, we'll give you an idea of uh, how uh, bills might be calculated for single family residences and commercial and industrial properties in the city. So, with that, I'd like to focus first on flood control. Um, this first slide is on Pleasant Street, as it says. It's from uh, back in 1936. When we, in the 30s, there were a number of very significant flooding events in the, in the Connecticut River area. Uh, it's floods like this one. This is Pleasant Street, and you can see this building. Some of you might recognize as Sylvester's. Right at the end is the Hotel Northampton. And then on the next slide, we show Main Street, and they give you some perspective of the railroad bridge, and over on the left is the Tosa Dow and um, That's what the city looked like before the flood control system was constructed. And on this next view, we show you that the, the system constructed by the Corps of Engineers consists of two major portions. There's the Mill River levee system, and there's a pump station over here, and there's the Connecticut River levee system with a pump station here. Um, further orientation is this is I-91 and this is Pleasant Street, Main Street, just to give you a, a feel, this is South Street. Um, so if you can keep this layout in mind, um, uh, Jim Dostal, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, prepared a video with uh, an Hampton cable uh, to describe the flood control system and some of the challenges we have in operating and maintaining it. And we'd like to look at that video now and then I'll pick up the presentation. Hello, I'm Jim Dostal, and I'm here to uh, bring you an overview of the Northampton flood control system. Uh, the system was built in 1940 uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers 
and they turned it over to the city to run and maintain uh, forever. The flood control system starts at College Lane at the dam on Paradise Pond. The Old Mill River bed was diverted down across West Street to South Street and then to the Oxbow. The drainage from the lower portion of the city still follows the Old Mill River bed to the flood control station. The other half of the flood control system starts at Pomeroy Terrace at the College Church and then loops around to Henry Street, over to Hockenham Road, then down to the flood control station. It continues on across the railroad tracks, crosses Route 5, and ties into the high ground in the back of Lyman Road. When the flood control station is put into operation, the gates are dropped to catch any debris coming down the channel. Water is diverted to the pump well in the flood control station. There are three engines capable of pumping 50,000 gallons a minute. One of these is a diesel installed about 25 years ago. The other two are 1940 vintage Sterling gasoline engines driving the pumps. Replacement parts cannot be bought for these antiquated machines. As of November 2013, one of these engines is down and parts have been sent to a machine shop for repair. Without these pumps, the city is vulnerable to flooding. There are three stop log structures, one at West Street, Route 66, one at the railroad crossing on Pleasant Street, and one on Route 5 by the bowling alley. The flood control dike system effectively creates a bowl around the lower portion of the city. The city has a flood control emergency plan and it is as follows. With the river elevation 106, we close the gate on the old mill riverbed and activate the flood control staffing. River elevation 107, the DPW closes Pension Meadow Road and Old Springfield Road. The DPW notifies dispatch and they alert police and fire. River Elevation 112, Central Dispatch notifies police, fire, mayor, central services, building inspector, and the Red Cross. The River Elevation 115 to 116, Montom Road nears flooding. Island Road and Ferry Street residents notified. Venturesfield Road and Hockenham Road closed. Police Department closes Montom Road at Atwood Drive. Fire Department sets up Emergency Management Center. At River Elevation 120, the mayor decides whether to call the Emergency Flood Board to a meeting at Carlin Drive. Emergency Manager orders B&M Railroad closed. DPW closes Old Ferry Road and installs center uprights for stop log structure at Route 5 and Montom Road. River Elevation 124, the sill at the stop log structure begins flooding Route 5. Stop log structure at B&M Railroad is one foot from flooding. Route 5 and railroad stop log structures are fully erected. Route 91 exit 18 ordered close. River Elevation 127, the mayor requests the governor to declare a state of emergency. The DPW erects full stop log structures on West Street. River elevation 130, the water is at the top of the concrete wall at the flood control station. Flood control and wastewater treatment plant personnel evacuate facilities. The flood control station has been activated 300 plus times since 1945. The gate is closed at elevation 107, protecting the inner city, and the farmland in the meadows is left vulnerable to flooding. The flood control system protects Northampton from potential flooding. The map shows what could happen if the dikes fail or the pumping station fails to operate. 
at river elevation 118, flooding of Lower Pleasant Street, Lower Conn Street, and Hockenham Road areas. At river elevation 127, all of Conn Street, Veterans Field, parts of Holly Street, and up to Bridge Street. At river elevation 137, all of Holly Street, Pleasant Street to Main, and Market to King. At elevation 147, the entire lower portion of the city would be underwater. To bring the flood control system in compliance, the city of Northampton must invest in its upkeep and maintenance. The stone riprap lining the Mill River bed and outside of the dike system needs to be cleared of all growth. The dikes require a 15-foot access road extending from the bottom on both sides. Any trees or structures in that zone must be removed. Parts of the Mill River need to be dredged. The flood control station may need upgrade or replacement. Future studies will determine which avenue to pursue. The Army Corps of Engineers has mandated that we do studies on the dike elevations and the flood control stations to determine cost. I know you folks realize Jim Goss was here with us this back in the back corner. And we appreciate Jim putting that video together because it certainly helps depict the situation far better than we can just standing up here and describing it. One of the comments that Jim made in his in the video was that the remnants of the old Mill Riverbed uh, still serve a function. You can see some pieces of it here in this light blue line came from Paradise Pond this way. It still serves an important function in the management of stormwater in the city. Before the river was diverted, all the pipes in the city and that part of the city flowed to that Mill River bed, and they still do. And there's conduits in certain areas and swales in others, but it still handles a lot of water that comes down, um, comes down from the upper portions of the city during the storm events. And, um, it's, it's critical in understanding the upper uh, flood pump station. This next slide is similar to the ones you saw in the video. It shows uh, some of the inundation that would take place if the dikes were not in place at, at elevation 127, which is the, uh, the approximate elevation that occurred back in those floods in the 30s. Um, and and then there's uh, also flooding that would take place over here along the Mill River. We put this little sketch together to try to convey you the importance of the flood pump station. Uh, the station needs to perform under two really pretty different sets of conditions. This little picture is a cross-section through the levee. The pump station is located at this location. This is the area outside the levee that's affected by the Connecticut River. This is the city side of the levee that's protected, uh, city side of the levee that's protected. Under normal conditions, this is uh, the old Mill River bed. Flows down to the dike. There's a conduit under the levee, and almost all the time, almost all the time. Flow just goes through that conduit and out to the Connecticut River. The pump station is needed when the water level in the Connecticut River rises because of some regional or New England-wide event such as a hurricane, heavy precipitation, or snow melt. And in that case, the water level reaches a point where it's no longer possible to flow through this pipe by gravity. We shut the valve and the pump station is turned on and it literally lifts the water up and puts it over the levee and into the Connecticut River. The other occasion where we need to operate the pump station is when the Connecticut River may be low because regionally there's no significant precipitation event. But in Northampton we might have had 
an intense thunderstorm, or some kind of local precipitation event, and then the flow coming down the, the old mill riverbed exceeds the capacity of this pipe. And in that case, we shut the valve, turn on the pumps, and pump that flow um, over the levee so that the flow doesn't back up into the city. So there, there are two very important functions that that pump station serves. Post-Hurricane uh, Katrina, the Army Corps of Engineers um, certainly discovered they had a problem in New Orleans with the failure, failure of the levees, and so they instituted a program across the, the country to reevaluate the condition of flood control systems so that that experience wasn't repeated in locations like North Hampton. The Corps of Engineers has come to the city with directives, as Councilor sort of Lavar mentioned, um, and they focus on, first, on improving maintenance. Jim talked about maintenance requirements um, in, the, in his video. Um, it would help to understand that when the Corps of Engineers built the flood control system in the late 30s and early 40s, the deal was the federal government paid for it as long as the city agreed in writing to operate and maintain. And the city's done that over the years. But the level of maintenance that the city's been able to provide with its um, limited budgets doesn't live up to the core's current standards. So that's what's changed. The core now understands that improperly maintained systems pose a risk to adjacent communities. The second requirement of the Corps of Engineers is to investigate the levees, the earthen structures, uh, and the pump station to make sure that they can is intended. Uh, there's concern that they may have settled, there may be erosion, uh, the soils uh, may not be as uh, resistant to the flow of water as they're supposed to be. The riprap structures, the stone on the surface may not be performing as originally intended. So they put together an extensive list of requirements that will require the city to retain the services of an engineer to study the system. And then the third piece is that pump station that Jim talked about in the video. Um, literally most of the components are original equipment. As you heard, uh, one of the pumps is not operational at the moment. Uh, you can't buy parts for this pump station off the shelf. Uh, the city's in the process of having some parts machined specifically for that engine. Uh, the process took up a month, I'm told, of buying it. My shop to fabricate the part. Two more months to manufacture them. And that's okay right, right now because we don't need that pump. But if it was in the middle of a heavy storm event, we'd be in big trouble. So that's the situation that we were faced with. And there are many aspects of that structure that, although it was modern in 1940, it just doesn't meet the standards. So we need to conduct a study of that station and understand what's needed to upgrade it. We can tell you today we know some of the costs to do this work. We can estimate the cost of the maintenance required by the Corps of Engineers and the cost to do the studies. And as it says here on the slide, that's about $1.2 million. What we don't know is that if they reveal that the levies uh, require additional work, we don't know what that price tag would be. And we don't know what the price tag would be to upgrade that large flood pump station, but we do know it would be expensive. With that, I'd like to move on and talk about the stormwater collection system. Um, the city's stormwater collection system goes back some portions of it over 100 years. Um, many sections of the city are served by pipes that are now under capacity. They might have been adequately sized when they were put in, but land use, um, addition of, of impervious parking lots, buildings, all contribute to stormwater runoff that now exceeds the capacity of many portions of our, of our stormwater system. Uh, there are certain sections of the city that don't have stormwater systems that need an experienced flooding. And with all of that, the city's experienced the ability or the inability to fund stormwater systems um, adequately over the past few years. Stormwater systems funded out of the general fund and those needs are in competition with all the other uh, needs funded uh, out of the general tax base, such as schools and fire and police and all the other services provided.
outside of the city. An example of that is uh, many of you may know that the city recently rebuilt the North Street section of the street, 4,000 feet long, so eight tenths of a lot, not a real long street. Uh, the money for the pavement came from some state funding. They have a Chapter 90 program that, that pays for pavement. The money to fix the water main came from the Water Enterprise Fund. The money for the Sanitary Sewer came from the Sewer Enterprise Fund. It took the city three years to come up with the money to fund the stormwater system at $225,000, which on one hand is a lot of money, but if you think about the needs of our stormwater system, it really isn't. And it took three years to come up with that money. The project was delayed, and so all the sources of funding were lined up. So that's the challenge we currently face in taking care of our stormwater system out of the general fund. This next slide shows um, the extent of the stormwater system. And all those little green squares are catch basins. And many of you may know catch basins are the structures along the edge of the road with cast iron grates that accept the water. They're connected by, um, in the case, we have, well, first of all, we have almost 5,000 catch basins in the city, a very large number. We have 114 miles of pipe. As it says up there, 325 outfalls. And an outfall is considered any place that the stormwater system discharges. So it might be a swale, it might be a little stream, it might be a no river, and eventually it flows in this area to the Connecticut River. And 190 culverts. It's an extensive system that if we were to try to replace it today, probably would have a price tag on the order of $200 million, perhaps more. So it's a very you know, valuable piece of infrastructure that we haven't been able to maintain properly over the years. And if you think about that North Street example, North Street as an example, with 140 miles of pipe, and if we we're only able to rebuild less than a mile in a three-year period, by the time we fix every pipe in the city, the, the pipe for fixing today will be old and in need of repair. So it's just not a manageable method of funding. Next slides. A couple of slides to show you what happens when, when the system fails. This is on, as it says, on Florence Street and Leeds. In this case, the drainage pipe failed. The water backed up, and the water actually had the force to lift the pavement. So not only did the city have to fix the pipe, they had to go in and fix the pavement, in this case. And this was uh, a few years ago on Prospect Street. You also uh, get sinkholes when, when the drainage system this last slide is a composite. It's intended to give you a sense for how significant some of our drainage systems are. These pictures come from North Street up here. This is very significant concrete pipe, probably 24 inch. Um, here's a uh, manhole structure being installed with probably 24, 30 inch pipe in it. It, it just shows you that uh, many aspects of our system are large and expensive. So although the Corps of Engineers regulates the flood control system, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency regulates uh, our stormwater system. And their, their interest in our stormwater system is in the quality of the water that is discharged in receiving streams. And, and they started issuing permits to communities about 10 years ago to coax communities into adopting better management practices so that the runoff from the streets and the parking lots and all of those locations um, carry less contaminants to receive the streets. Now that that 10 year period has passed, they're ready to start issuing a new round of permits. Uh, the city doesn't have its, have its permit yet, but it's seen draft permits for other communities and it's been assured that its permit's going to look very much like the draft permits that have been issued in other locations. These permits will definitely increase the amount of work required by the city to comply with the permits, all geared toward improving uh, the water quality. Some of them are, the city tries to clean every catch basin, all of those almost 5,000 catch basins once a year. We're not successful because of limited resources. Um, one of the new requirements is to 
mean every catch basin at least once a year, but then make sure that these catch basins don't fill up during the year so that they don't do their job. So the city then has to figure out which catch basins tend to fill up and go back and clean those as many times as necessary so that they're always functioning properly. So that's an example of more work. Uh, those 190 alcohols that we mentioned in the slide, some of those will have to be sampled for contaminants. And if contaminants are found, there'll have to be an investigation to find out why contaminated water is coming out of that pipe, for example. There's a public education requirement. There almost certainly will be a requirement to reduce the nitrogen discharge in stormwater. This all evolves from problems in Long Island Sound that are, are caused by nitrogen. And, and communities up and down the Connecticut River in both states, primarily in Connecticut and Massachusetts, Massachusetts have been pressured for years now to take action to reduce the discharge of nitrogen to the receiving waters. And so we'll have to deal with that. And that last bullet deals with another technique. It's sort of a broad category of green infrastructure. But what it really drives at is as we modify our drainage system, we need to try to provide the ability for that to have the stormwater infiltrate into the ground. That reduces the peak flow that leaves in the pipes. It provides some level of treatment by filtration through the ground, and it also recharges our own groundwater as opposed to sending the water down, down the river. So that's the that's the stormwater. Um, so what's what's been happening? Back in March, the city council passed an order that created a stormwater ad hoc advisory task force to look at the issue of how can the city possibly fund all these new directors. Um, you can see the, the makeup of the membership up there on the slide. This committee met 12 times. Uh, two to three hours of time in a three month period last spring. Uh, the members did work on their own between meetings. It really, they really did a terrific job. And uh, their mission, as shown on the next slide, their mission was to consider possible sources of funding and come up with a recommendation for the city. And of course, they considered the general fund, which is our current method. And I've already talked about some of those problems. They considered or talked about the use of overrides to fund it and um, concluded that there's some inconsistency and in risk associated with funding work through overrides. They talked about a stormwater and flood control fee. It's a technique used by some other communities, some in Massachusetts and others countrywide, to fund it. And then they also talked about a possible combination of some of these methods. Uh, we understand that the city of Westfield adopted a stormwater utility a few years ago and attempted to split the cost between their general fund and the fee. Um, and now we understand that they um, think that that's not working as well as it should have been considered. Uh, but it just shows you the different models out there. Um, and the task force looked at those uh, and came back to the city in July with a set of recommendations and some recommendations. Their recommendation was to create a stormwater and flood control fee. They thought that that was the most reliable, consistent way to fund all these requirements and allow the city to start to maintain its, its um, systems. And the re you know, they, they reached that conclusion uh, really based on a couple of considerations. One, what I've talked about before, it's just not feasible, it, it just doesn't even seem to be a uh, topic of discussion to get this kind of money, perhaps up to $2 million a year, out of um, the general fund. The general fund is strapped this year, how can we come up with more money, especially in that order of magnitude. And second, a fee applies to every property in the city. That was their concept. There are entities in the city that, that are exempt nonprofits or exempt from general taxation, so they don't participate in the general fund as a source. Um, this task force thought this was truly a citywide problem and that every property in the city should be contributing, and that's an aspect of a, of a utility fee. Um, 
that, that they can achieve that goal. And you'll see an interesting pie chart at the end of the presentation that drives home that point. And then one of the other concerns of the task force was, well, if DPW thinks that the project program is going to cost $2 million in year one, what's going to happen in year two, and year three, and year four, and, you know, hold on. And so they came back with a recommendation that there should be a cap on the total amount of money raised by this uh, utility fee for the first five years. A cap on the amount raised each year for the first five years. They came up with a couple of different formulas to use to calculate the bills for each property in the city. Um, and then they also recommended that the city consider uh, instituting a system of credits for people that implemented measures, properties that had measures that helped control stormwater dispatch from their property, or incentives to get people to um, uh, take on, uh, incorporate stormwater control measures in their property. So then in August, City Council passed another order. It accepted the report from the task force. It directed the Board of Public Works to draft an ordinance along the lines of the report from the task force. And, and along those lines, the Board of Public Works formed two committees. One committee focused on how can you equitably build each property in the city. And the second was, and the second subcommittee focused on this whole issue of credits. Board of Public Works did a fair amount of work and in September presented the results of its work at a public meeting, received public comment, went back, changed the ordinance, and then um, submitted it to the City Council. So the draft ordinance that's in front of the City Council is the reason we're holding these ward meetings. Um, covers a number of topics. The one I want to focus on um, most specifically is the method of billing. And the thought was, as, as, as you look at a, at a parcel of property, a piece of property, most properties have a portion of its surface that's impervious. It's a hard surface, like a roof or a driveway or a sidewalk. It sheds water very quickly when it rains. And it has a portion of impervious, grass, a natural surface, like grass or trees or something like that. And the idea was to try to weight those two elements of a piece of property Heavily weight the impervious, the size of the impervious area, and lightly weight the part that accepts rainwater like grass and woodlands and come up with a way to characterize each property so that it can be built. And the thought was, well, those impervious surfaces, those hard surfaces that contribute to runoff, let's weight that at 0.95. Let's say that 95% of the water that hits that surface runs off has to be handled by the stormwater system. And for the pervious surface, the grasses, lawns, trees, gardens, let weight that very lightly at point one, which means like 10% of the water that hits that surface runs off. And that seemed to be a pretty fair way to do it. Then they went one step further and said for residential properties, one to three family units, let's try to standardize the billing process. First of all, it represents 6,600 properties in the city. Um, there seemed to be uh, a sense of uh, fairness that, that property owners in, in, in that range all paid about the same amount. Um, as a result of the public hearing, the board was encouraged to consider a tiered system. So they adopted a three-tier system based on the amount of impervious area on the property. Tier one is if you have up to 2,000 square feet of impervious area. Again, there's roof, driveway, walkway. Tier two is 2,000 to 4,000 square feet. And tier three is 4,000 and above. All the other properties in the city, uh, residential, four units and greater, industrial, commercial, not profit, open space, they'll all be calculated separately. Um, and they're 2,600 levels, so it's, it's, a, it's a sizable task. There was a concern that this system uh, might impact too heavily, the financial impact might be too great on large tracts of open space, 
um, which are good for the city for, for a, a lot of different reasons and good for stormwater control. So the, there's a recommendation that those, those areas, any pervious area, again, that's the grass or the trees, those areas be capped at one acre. So if you have one acre of pervious area, your bill will be based on one acre. If you have 10 acres, it's just going to be based on one acre. And that seems to be um, pretty fair, and it sort of met the goals of the program. And then, as I mentioned already, a budget, a budget was developed, and in order to meet uh, the flood control system needs on a consistent basis, the stormwater EPA needs on a consistent basis, and also start dealing with the deteriorated infrastructure that we have. The budget um, was estimated at $2 million. The fees that were calculated here are based on the $2 million budget. This next slide shows an aerial view of the neighborhood. Um, this purplish pink color highlights all the hard and curvy surfaces on each of those parcels. It's actually done automatically through um, state GIS geographical information system. It's, it's pretty slick what some technology can do. And it gives the city the tools to measure parcel by parcel um, the impervious area and the total area um, uh, in the city. Now, rather than do that for each uh, residential property up to three units, one to three units. As I said, those were that data is averaged by group. So if you're in tier one, the, the, the estimated bill would be $61 a year, and that's based on the average characteristics of all the properties in tier one. <coughs> tier two, 2,000 or 4,000 square feet of the previous area, the bill would be um, about $97 a year. In tier three, These bills would be issued quarterly um, by the new government. So then this next slide shows an example of how a non-residential property would be built. Um, this is a nonprofit at Schooley Dickinson. Uh, all the, the color, the purple building roofs and the, the light blue driveways and roadways um, highlight all the impervious property of Cooley Dickinson. And on the next slide, the impervious area is over 600,000 square feet. That's like 68 acres. And it's <coughs> impervious area. That is heavily weighted because the water runs off it quickly at 0.95. So in this formula, we're going to base their bill for the impervious area on 650,000 square feet. For the pervious area, the lawns and the woods, they have over a million square feet of pervious area. That's on the order of 27 acres. There's a cap. Remember the one acre cap? They only get built on the basis of one acre, 43,000 square feet. And then again, only a 10% of that. So the pervious area bill, that portion of the bill is only based on 4,000 square feet. But then what you do is you add the two components together, you come up with a total. For the purposes of the ordinance, that's defined as the hydraulic acreage. That's the blended number that contributes to runoff from this particular parcel. And then a rate's developed, dollars per square foot, this happens to be 2.366 cents. Doesn't sound like a big number until you look at how many square feet they had to pay for. <laughs> Their bill under this system would be $15,507. And that process would, would, is, is what would happen to each of the 2,600 properties that are large residential or units of more commercial, industrial, nonprofit, uh, open space, anything but small residential. Last minute. Not quite last, but near the end, we're close to the end. The, the whole issue of credits and incentives is still under discussion. Um, it turned out to be the concept is um, is a good one. If, if a property is invested money to try to 
provide uh, some retention of the stormwater or some better level of treatment. They maybe they spend some money, maybe they should get a, a break on their bill from the city. Then you start looking at the details and it, it gets fairly complicated. Uh, but these are some of the concepts that are being discussed. Uh, and the city will continue to work on these, try to define these. Um, there is one for low income people. The city clerk uh, already has a system to identify low income residents in the city. Uh, the proposal is to use that same system, not come up with a new system. Uh, I feel pretty certain that portion will be implemented. So that's where we are on credits. And then on exemptions, uh, this is an interesting topic um, that's being uh, debated at the moment. If you think back to the task force's recommendation, they felt strongly that every property in the city should contribute. Um, the planning board has, a, as part of its mission, to encourage people that own uh, undeveloped property to put it under either a conservation or an agricultural restriction so that it will never be developed um, in the future. And it's difficult to get people to uh, participate in these programs. And so the planning department would like to if yeah, there was a little more care to help people uh, make that decision. And so that's the debate that's going on today. Uh, on the one hand, it would amount to maybe fifteen or seventeen thousand dollars in uh, exemptions, a fairly significant number. But if you think about the two million dollar budget that you might be dealing with, it's less than one percent. So it's it's an important discussion, but it it shouldn't derail this whole process. Uh, if this method is, is accepted formulas that I've talked about are accepted. It's a fairly mechanical process to calculate the bill for a property. And if somebody gets a bill and they think it's, they think it's wrong, there will be an appeal process in an argument should be resolved pretty easily. You go to the superintendent, director of public works, and the city will look at the characteristics of your property, show you how your bill was calculated. Um, and then if, if you think it was calculated improperly to get to present your case. And it usually will boil down to how many square feet of inquiries and purpose here you have. Um, if that process is not satisfactory, the Board of Public Works has an appeal process and process of claims that will appear um, for the process. On this next slide, I know the font's small. We have copies of this that you can pick up at the end. Um, they're also online on the city's website. This shows um, the, the sample bills for the three tier residential uh, categories that we talked about earlier. And then some other properties in the city that, that you certainly will recognize. And it will give you an idea of what some of these commercial and industrial properties or what some undeveloped land in the city might be paying. Uh, just to give you a sense for how everybody will be contributing uh, to this fund if it's, if it's adopted. Uh, the department has received a number of requests from property owners to have uh, their bill pre-calculated now so they know where they fit in this whole scheme. And unfortunately, the answer is with 6,600 residential and 2,600 large residential. It's just too many requests to, to undertake at the moment. The staff is trying to work on other aspects of this ordinance. So we ask for your patience in that regard. But certainly if you're in a one to three family unit, um, knowing that the trigger is how many square feet of the previous area you have, um, I'm sure you can all do a quick estimate uh, and figure out which year you might fall. Next slide I alluded to earlier. On the left, it shows the distribution of revenue that funds the general fund. Residential properties pay 83% of the revenue collected by the city. Um, commercial and industrial, 17%. Back when the task force was considering an 
equitable way to deal with this problem. They like the concept of a fee because more properties participate in the cost. The residential portion in aggregate will pay 51% using the formulas that I've talked about tonight. Commercial and industrial will pay 24%. The city properties will pay 9%, tax exempt 10%, and other 7%. Uh, open space, primary is an example of some of the other. So that's the, the attractiveness of, um, of a fee structure as opposed to the taxation. So where are we today? Uh, the draft ordinance was submitted to the city council back in October. City council referred it to subcommittees. And now only these board meetings, uh, also meetings with the Chamber of Commerce and other interest groups. And it will soon go to the city council for Full, full city council deliberation of uh, And then lastly, uh, where can you go for more information? Uh, the city has an excellent website and right on the home page the links to information about this program. You can follow those links. If that doesn't work, Council of Art introduced Jim Lorla, the city engineer. He's here and he's going to help me answer questions tonight. But you can approach him with questions. And then lastly, as this moves forward to the city council, we encourage you to check the calendar to find out when it's going to be discussed um, and uh, participate uh, that way. So, with all of that, um, we're ready to take questions. I'm going to ask Jim to help you with, uh, with the questions. Yes, sir. And could you please state your name and address when you ask? Charlie Dumas, 4 Penn Castle Drive, in Florence here. I'd like to know, I saw the figure for Smith College at 62,000. Is that before credits or after? All the bills that were shown in that table that Mike showed are, are uh, before the credits. I, I don't understand why an institution that doesn't pay a dime of real estate taxes gets a credit. Can you answer that for me? Well, I think the, uh, the desire to have a credit program within the system was something that was recommended by the task force. And I think the, the thinking was that um, for some of the development that Smith College does or Cooley Dickinson or some of the commercial developments on King Street, they may invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in building stormwater control systems. And the people on the task force felt that it would only be fair to give some of these parties a credit on their bill um, because of the amount of money that they had invested during the development. Why should you give somebody a credit that doesn't pay a dime in real estate taxes? So the credit, so I'll, I'll explain, I'll explain a little bit about the credit. Um, a credit doesn't mean that the city somehow gives them a check or something for something. No, they're not giving right. them a check, they're giving them a discount. Right, a discount. So the, the right, why? Yeah, they Why? Don't it, uh, they don't pay uh, real estate taxes. They don't give city donations. The, the, it's, it's actually also serves as an incentive. Because remember, the big problem is, is actually the manifestation of stormwater and how it impacts the community. And anything we can get to do to get anybody, homeowner, Smith, Cooley Dickinson, to reduce the contribution of water the better. And I think, I and mean, that's part of what the discussion was in the ad hoc. Um, it, be, this can actually be debated on the council floor, it's the same thing, whether Smith or, or nonprofits are qualified for the Oh, I'm sorry. Want to repeat it? Yes. Okay. The purpose of, the, of this is an incentive to reduce the introduction of stormwater. So it's, it's not actually to give anyone, you know, it's, it's, it's not to cut a break from institutions. It's actually since the institution is one of the major contributors as reflected in their fee for the stormwater. If we can give them an incentive or anybody an incentive to reduce that stormwater, because that's what's driving this, how much water is contributing to the process and what impacts this system that we need to maintain. So anyone, if they don't have the incentive, 
if they don't have a, a financial incentive, they're not necessarily inclined to do it. The selling now, water is going to run off when it rains, whether the they get an incentive or not. Well, the stormwater is going to run off or it's going to be retained on the property, the same thing. If, it's a, if, if they have a non-permeable surface and they create whatever system that's available, and I don't know what that is. I don't know. Can everyone hear me? Okay. The, I mean, and in point of fact, this is a recommendation. So it can still, as I said, it can still be debated on the council floor. But the fact is, is that uh, the reason for it, um, you asked why this is being considered, and I'm, I'm explaining to you why it's being considered. And it's being considered. It's not a fait accompli, it's not carved in stone, it's not a done deal. But the fact is, is the reason is not to give Smith a break. It's not to give Cooley Dickinson a break. This is, we're actually, personally, I'm excited that we actually have a, finally have an opportunity to get a taste here, to get a contribution from these institutions and, and that, to date, as you say, are, are exempt from tax contributions into the community for prop, certain, certain properties. Smith does actually pay some no, top tax, but, but nowhere near the proportion that you and I pay. Right. But if we can actually encourage, because what's really driving this is the water. It's not the money. The money is the problem that we got to dole out. If they can reduce, if we can reduce the pressures of the water, contribution. If that means reducing their input into the community stormwater, that's to the good. I think that's to the good. And if they don't have the incentives and they don't do that, we still have the problem and it's still going to have to be paid for. So there's the rough. I mean, and that's the rough explanation. Bill, could you just explain that a little more? Are they going to are they going to be charged the full amount and be given an incentive break when they do something, or are they automatically going to be well, given? Well, as I understand, the proposal currently is this is true yeah, of everybody. Yes. Is everybody? Is you're assessed your your how much contribution you are mm -hmm. contributing roughly to the to the stormwater runoff. And we haven't established that. That's what that's what Mike was saying. That we haven't actually figured out what those incentives would be. We're trying to figure out an incentive package. That was a recommendation of the ad hoc. Um, but it'd be across the board for everyone. So if you did something, you would get a, a correction and end it on your assessed fee. The one time. The one time. One time. Oh, one year. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's, that, no, no, no that's, that, that's all part of the debate. That's all part of the debate. If you, if, I mean, I, you can make a good case. If you, if you uh, reduce your input to the stormwater, that doesn't exist for one year. It should last the duration of the, of the system. And I, I think Smith would, I, would argue the same. Yes, sir. Uh, I could spend 15 minutes talking about this, but I don't want to take other people's time. I'm Paul Walker, 52 Gilbrain Terrace, and I served as the Executive Director of the Chamber of Commerce of the city for 18 years. I was shocked last night. I attended many of your meetings, and I questioned whether every city council will read the 103-page report this is almost like our health care bill being debated nationally. However, what shocked me was the reading that was lit this week. Drainage fairground projects get $3 million tubes. Why the fairground? Why Ward 3? I asked at one of the meetings, were we lobbying our senators to get a grant for the city for this project? Nobody would answer that, but it's obvious there was a discussion going on that a grant was coming. We should have been in Washington, we should have been in Boston, Colcott and uh, the fellow from Amherst. They should have been lobbying for that money for the entire project for our city, not one war. And I was talking about Washington to get a grant? Have you worked on a grant for us from the federal government? 
We work on all the grant programs. I know you say you work on all of them. Have you done one for North Ham? Well, we worked with the mayor's office on, on the one. Well, he, he works he with the mayor's office. to work with the well, have you been there? To Washington? I have not been to Washington. Okay, so why not? You don't have to go to Washington to get a grant well, for a drainage project. Well, why not go to Boston then? Have you been to Boston? I have been to Boston. And what, what do you get from Boston? Well, we get grants all the time for different projects. And we have a for, for Ward 3. Yeah. How about us? Please, 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 Ward 7. Ward 7. Ward Sandy Beach. 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 The last point I'd like to make. We're rushing in this hunt. The state of Virginia took the case to the federal judge of that state, and the judge overturned the decision that you could use rainwater as a means of tax. Rainwater is out of your control and my control. How about the snowstorm? I don't see anything. I gave this report to a young man that serves on a planning board down in Texas. And he reviewed it, and on every page, he's got a question that it should be asked. I want to know about snow. What's going to be done? Did you calculate the snowfall? Is that rainwater? Yeah, I have drainage problems from the city water going on my land. But I want to address another issue. And you're saying you could uh, put your land in uh, for the big landowners in town, they could put it in the conservancy and stuff. Wouldn't that be limiting the tax base and any fruit to grow? Uh, any extra taxes would be cheered by just the members in the city now, as opposed to new members, new people coming into the town. So we're effectively shutting the town off from development. Is, wouldn't that be the case? I don't think that's a question. Is that a, that's not specifically a question related to stormwater. It's, well, it's well, about, well, land, about land conservation. If, if you require people to turn their land into conservation land, so it wouldn't be developed, they would get the lower rate, maybe. So basically give the developers rights away. So that means all that land would never be used for housing. And they would never become part of the tax base as that, homeowners. That's true. So everybody here in this room would pick up more and more tax burden. And it's supposed to the city dwellers and spreading the tax base out. Isn't that the case? Well, that would be true. I think the, the, right. ben the, ben the benefits of the, the fee program that's proposed that Mike explained earlier is that it has the effect of spreading the... Uh, but you're cutting them out. It has... It has of spreading it, you're dropping it down. There'll be less people paying into it. If the conservation yeah. exceptions go through. That's yeah. Correct. That's correct. Thank you. I'm Donna Slocum. I live at 4 Penn Castle Drive in Florence. I think we're all, like, stuck here, you know, not having a word to say because as our counselor said at the beginning of the meeting, it's mandated, it's going to happen. I've already talked to other city counselors in other areas, and I've been told, it's going to happen. So where is our choice in the matter? Why is, why did it get to be this bad? Yeah. What I want to know is, according to Jim's film, this equipment didn't get this bad overnight. It's taken years for that equipment. And I mean, we're, we're dealing with equipment that's over 60 something years old. Why wasn't it replaced sooner? Why are we having to pay this? Who didn't have the foresight for proper maintenance? Like we have a planning. And you know, I just think it's bad, as I say, why are we always it, it, up, up here, always paying for Ward 3 in downtown? It's not right. I, my biggest objection to all of this is to, to have to pay for an anchor and some place like Smith College or the hospital have to pay for an anchor. That is not right, that's not fair. They're gonna get more credits. They have a lot more money than we do to spend on this. Somebody has to go back to the planning board before this all starts. I think the way the, I think the, way the proposed fee, as Mike had explained, that the proposed fee is so heavily weighted to developed areas, so areas that have a lot of asphalt, the large buildings, 
those are the types of facilities that are going to get the really big bills that, uh, that are shown on the table that, that Mike explained. And this gentleman earlier said the, the bill for Smith College would be over $60,000. So the idea was to weight the bills heavily toward development that have those types of services and not so much on residential properties that may have more grass or trees or, or lawn, those sorts of things. So when we pick up our drivers, our bill would be lower and we plant grass. Oh, it's not roof. What's that? Sod roof. Sod roof uh, might be eligible for credit. We'll have to wait and see. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned about seeing your That's assessment abatement. On the yeah. assessment abatement, yeah. okay. My question is, I have many, many seniors in this ward and throughout the city. If they are or if they have some money in the bank, 20000 40000 they cannot get anything that you're talking about. They will not get exempt, and I find that to be very unfair. I think we need to look at seniors, we need to look at if they're 65 or 70, then they should be exempt also. Just because they've worked all their lives and they have money in the bank, they have that money there to take care of them if they should get ill. We look at low income. What do you mean by low income? So the, the programs, the, uh, the credit programs are, haven't totally been worked out. But the Board of Public Works has been investigating options I had decided that it would be a reasonable approach to use existing programs in the city that allow for things like tax abatements, as Council Dwight mentioned, and also for people that get uh, a discount or they don't pay the CPA tax. So there's a whole program set up for low-income folks to not pay CPA tax. So right, there's a program. I'm having a problem with that because when you say low income, that could be what, 23000 12000 9,000 a year. Some people go over 100 to 200 to 300 up over that bracket. They are exempt. So I really would like to have this looked at very, very carefully because I think seniors need to have a break. No matter if they have 30 or 40,000 in the bank, we need to look at the seniors. So if you're going to exempt a senior, but because they're under of what they have or somebody else has in the bank versus a low-income family. And also, how do you know with a low-income family, are they working a part-time job? Or people today need two or three jobs to survive. I know the people on my ward, they can just about make it, and I told you this. Okay, we're looking at seniors, we're looking at income. Some are still paying mortgages on their homes. They have car payments. They have food to put on the table. We need to look at what are we going to do with the seniors. I think all seniors should be treated equally. Don't split it. Treat them all. Exempt them. Somehow give them an exemption. Yeah, thanks, uh, you know, clearly it's a very important issue and one that uh, that the Board of Public Works has taken very seriously in terms of consideration for all the seniors. The details of that credit program haven't been worked out, but, but clearly it's, it's very important and the Board will pay attention to that. It's something that's not specific to the ordinance uh, right now, but it's very important. We appreciate you. I really wish that you would look at that, because I'm hearing it from many people throughout the city about the seniors that exempt, exempt, but it goes by income. So, and even if you own a piece of property as a senior, you cannot get exempt because that's collateral. That's unfair also. Um, well, I should, excuse me a second, but the, 
that's on us. That's on you and me and Councilor Adams and the other councilors. That the, the, the exemption, the schedule, and all that stuff's going to be on the council. The, these guys were taking all the heat, so maybe I should stay standing up here so I can take some of it too. But uh, these guys actually just helped pour, they laid out the problem, they presented the problem, they pre presented the money. They're all, the ad hoc committee made the recommendations, um, asking these two guys to <laughs> change the recommendations isn't fair. That's on us. The counselors are the ones who are going to ultimately vote that. So maybe it's more appropriate that I stay standing here and, and answer those questions more appropriately for them to take the heat about <laughs> why water flows downhill. <laughs> <laughs> One question that I didn't see the answer there, I know you showed me in that chart, you had the city being 9% of the earnings. But that includes the streets, I'm sure. That's right. Okay. But I'm just saying, you're putting it all on the taxpayers, but if you spread out a little bit more, if the city on the tax rate got some of the bill for the impervious area, which is the street, which I'm sure takes up a great deal of space, brings a lot of water down there that has to be pumped, et cetera, and all that stuff. Because I'm a little bit annoyed just from the sewer feed we have that was supposed to be used to maintain the, the sewers we had here. But yet that fee was used to build new sewers, to do the uh, park where the North Yankee State Hospital was, et cetera, stuff. That wasn't what the original intent was in that fee. That fee was for maintaining of the, of, the, of the sewers and funding the treatment plant and building this stuff here. But once it gets into the city council and the planning board gets involved, they're going to take cash wherever they can, and we as the fee payers have no input because we don't even know what's happening. So I'm saying if we're going to do this stuff with the fee for an urban area, one area which I think is the largest in the city is the streets. Okay. And I think the total taxpayers should be paying for it. The, uh, and point in fact, actually, you'll notice that the city, there's that part of the debate from the ad hoc City's actually being asked to pay a lot of But that's 9%. That's, that's for the schools, possibly, the it, school parking lot, right. et cetera. No, and, but, and part of the thing that drove the debate, if you'll let me finish, please, and then I'll, I'll get out of the way. But part of the what drove that debate was you're the city, I'm the city, everyone here is the city. So some people said that stuff was dead. It was one argument, right? You know, we're, the fact is, is the city's not some special agency that has its own money. He said, we're, that's our tax money that we're paying for it. So it's, in, in a sense, the fee that you're getting to say, $67, then you add to that also. And I'm just presenting the argument. So uh, I, yeah. I, I don't deny that, but I then ask the question, does the city, schools, et cetera, do they pay for water and sewer fee off the tax rate? They, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, there's some questions over here too, if, it, if we can go over here. Um, I'm Paula Brescia, I live at 11 Elmer Court in Florence. And um, there's a few things. First, it seems like really rushed, like all of a sudden we have to do this. And we've had several capital projects in this city, and not, I mean, we have the fire station, the police station. I mean, these are major expenses, and now all of a sudden we have the stormwater thing. And um, even with those projects, there were committees that were formed, there were years. By the time we came to passing the two and a half override, people were very knowledgeable about them. I don't see that happening here, although I know that's why you're getting the word out. So the other thing is this came from FEMA or something. I mean, this system wasn't put in by the city. It was put in by the Army Corps of Engineers. And the city, for whatever reason, maintained it as best they could. I don't think so. Or, or, not, or not, or not, but here we are in a situation, and so that's up to question. And then it says we're going to do studies, we're maintaining, we want two million a year for how many years? I mean, I, I don't, I feel really kind of queasy about the fact that I don't know if we know what we're doing, because there hasn't been updating. We haven't had the studies done yet. We're, the first two million is going to for the for the studies. Well, for the studies. If, um, there's multiple part question or comment. Yeah. The, uh, actually, the conversation has been well since I've been a counselor. This I'm, I'm going on to my 
Well, it, it, since Councilor Labarge was first sworn in 16 years ago, the discussion, this discussion about stormwater and how we address the issues that we're, we're talking about has been ongoing. It's, it's, it's been ongoing, it's, it's crested, if you'll pardon the pun, at this point where we're actually with the mandates. And I should also point out the mandates are being challenged. They're still being challenged. And so it's, it's a possibility that the mandates may not, some of the mandates might not be enforced. So the mandates that were described here are uh, already in, in process. But there are other mandates that are coming that, that are being challenged and there's been some suggestions they're going to slow down the, the requirement. The federal government built that dike system at our request. At our request. Um, that was back in the day uh, when it was 1936 was the flood, 1938, 1940. It was at the point when federal government was investing in large infrastructure developments and projects. The Army Corps of Engineers designed it. Our deal was they give us those that levy system, we maintain it. And as far as and, and you probably want to ask about the maintenance. So why do we, we want to move to that part of the question? I want to ask go over Road. I want to ask why didn't the city maintain the infrastructure instead of buying or preserving land that they can't afford to maintain either? Uh, and then put on our taxes as a burden. They knew about it, you said, 16 years, how many years ago? Well, we, Why wasn't this thing taken care of? You, you want to talk to that point, Ned, about the, you know, the maintenance and deferred uh, maintenance issues? Sure. Well, you did uh, ask him. The, the, the ladies are right. Maintenance. You knew it. miles of storm drainage system that we can't do anything about because it's insurmountable. The pumping station is in such ill repair. I mean, I, I, I'm almost getting like, you know, you know, everything is, everything is trauma here, you know, that everything is. <laughs> we're is, at the breaking point. We're not what, getting what, what, a positive, what like this is what we're going to do. This is what needs to be done. We can update this. I don't think it's fair to the city to be left to maintain a system that's how many years old? 70 years old? I mean, there's got to be some upgrading somewhere down the line, and nobody helped the city with that. So, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, the, this is kind of a unique system. I don't know. I haven't lived any place else that had a flood system. So I think, you know, that is what our government's there for. That's what the Army Corps of Engineers was for. And I wish there was a little bit more cooperation instead of just coming down to the city that we have to do all this without giving us, uh, FEMA giving us an interest-free loan or offering the National Guard or Westover to come in and give us a hand or something. You know, I think it's a, you know, I think we're all in this boat, and we all got to figure out a way to, to, to work together to get where we need to go. Well, but there's I'd lots of I'd like to talk about the, uh, the maintenance of the flood control system just for a minute, because I don't want people to leave thinking that the city hasn't been ma maintaining this system. <laughs> this is one of the most important pieces of infrastructure within the city, and I think it's a credit to the people like Jim Gostel who, who maintain this system for such a long time that we actually have pumps that are 70 years old that still work. These things still work. And that's not without the hard work of a lot of people that take care of them day in and day out. Now the issue with them is that they are old. They do need to be replaced. Ned has been in front of the city council and the mayor many times in capital improvement saying, these pumps are very old. It would be in the best interest to protect the city if we could replace these pumps. And every year, there's no money available to replace the pumps. I think one pump of the three has been replaced in the last 25 years. The city is really at a point of tremendous stress in terms of relying on a system that may not function under a certain storm event. That's why this is so important. In addition to just the basic age of a system and trying to maintain it, we also have demands from the core which is saying, this is a very old system. It was designed a long time ago. Some of the design standards today are different than they were 70 years ago. Can you guarantee us that the system is going to work for the flood that you think it's going to work? These are some of the studies that Mike was suggesting that need to be done. So there's a lot of things that have changed. Think about the city of Northampton in 1940. How much development was there downtown? How much pavement was there? Not as much as today. 
how much more runoff is going down that channel, the Mill River, uh, the old Mill River channel that Mike discussed that ends up at this pump station. Believe me, a lot more water today than in 1940. What about the intensity of the storms that we've been seeing in the past few years? These thunderstorms we get, some of the hurricane rains we've been seeing, tremendous amounts of water that this old ancient system is expected to handle, and we're here just kind of crossing our fingers, thinking it's going to work. It's been it's maintained well, but it's old, it's an old, old system. The federal government does not pay for these systems anymore. So they've asked us to look at the system, figure out what needs to be done, and implement a plan over the next few years to make sure that this system is going to protect the city. We can't sit here and just pretend that something that's this old without looking at it is going to protect us under a large under a large storm event. It would be it would be a folly to do that. John, I live on Ryan Road just across the street. In fact, I have a 135 feet of driveway. I put it in 20 years ago, and it's stone. Most people think I'm crazy. It's hard to blow, snow blow uh, a stone driveway, but I've got a snow blower that's set up to do that without any problems. So I have a pervious driveway, as far as I'm concerned. But a couple of things have come up. I've been studying this for a long time. And uh, it looks to me like all of a sudden, the federal government once again has mandated some stuff, and they're, they're, they're putting all of the onus on the local community to take care of the problem. And I've canoed the Connecticut River from the lakes all the way down to the Long Island Sound. Uh, I know what it does. I know how far it drops. I have a pretty good feel for the river. I've been on the river a long time. And uh, my sister lives at the far end, but over in Greenwich, so to speak. But uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I can see the effect that the whole thing is having. My concern is that the feds, and I, maybe it's not the Army Corps of Engineers, although I'm sure the 5,500 people that work in New England for the Army Corps of Engineers are probably excellent engineers, but look what they did in New Orleans. I mean, they worked on that project for years and it totally failed. So I have some questions and concerns about that, but I'm also concerned about the idea that they're putting on our shoulders the idea of finding somebody to go and analyze the work that they did 70 years ago. And, and I think it's really up to the federal <coughs> government to step up to the plate. Why? Because this river starts in Connecticut, in, in Canada, it comes down through Vermont, New Hampshire, and then it passes through us, and we're that one spot in the river where there's, we're a weak point in the river, uh, kind of like a hernia. But the, this, we can, affect, we can affect downstream just as easily. We're gonna affect Holyoke if, if the waters here build up to a great extent. And then we're gonna, we're gonna affect further downstream. So I, I think it's up to the feds to do something about this. I think it's up to them to, to come up with some money. And I, you know, Mr. Walker talked about going to Washington. I've been to Washington for maybe 20 years of my life. Sometimes I wonder why I bothered to go there. And I've been, although it's been a great experience, I, I, I've sat in Kennedy's office, I've sat in Kerry's office, they were wonderful places to be in. And any time we went there, we were always accepted by the people that, that are representing us. And so I think it's really important for somebody to go to Washington and start asking for some of this help that we should be getting to, do, to address this problem. And, and one last part. I'm doing a job, or I'm going to be doing a job up at Otis Reservoir, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with Otis Reservoir. They just drain it. They drain it every year. It's a holding tank for the Farmington River that floods up in Vermont, comes down through Otis, and the reason Otis is there is so that the town of Farmington won't be deluged with a flood. So every year they, they control this, and, and I'm just wondering why somebody hasn't even looked into something like this. In the middle of the summer, I can't water my grass because the Mill River isn't deep enough all of a sudden, but we've got plenty of water in our reservoir. So I'm wondering, you know, with all the things that we have here in the city, why we're not even storing some of this excess water that might come in on a flood or rain off or whatever the problem is, pump it into a holding tank, so to speak, a reservoir that we have just for that purpose, not for drinking, but and, and it seems to me we have two reservoirs up in Leeds. And I don't know all the ramifications of, say, 
uh, dredging a, 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 an old uh, derelict uh, reservoir uh, and uh, making it deeper so that it can actually hold water and, and doing those kinds of things. I don't know what's involved with it. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff involved with it. But, uh, and then last but not least, I, I have read your letters on the website and uh, I recognize that you guys have been doing some maintenance and, and but here's one last point and then I'll shut up. Uh, I'm retired and if you need somebody to cut weeds down on the dikes, call me. <laughs> Well, I guess all, all I'll say is that uh, you make a lot of really good points, and uh, there's no, no disagreement about any of them. Um, I'll say that to the extent that we can work with our congressional delegation on getting the federal government to provide more funding or to take more responsibility with the things that we need to do, we do the best we can in that regard. Um, I think anybody that reads the, reads the news uh, has a sense that the federal government's not exactly handing out a lot of dollars lately. Uh, in flood control, they're not so interested in not a real top priority for them, other than to tell communities like us and, and many others across the country that we agreed to take responsibility as a city for the operation and maintenance of the flood control things that they built, and they're holding the city to that obligation. It was one that wasn't born when that obligation was made. We're just trying to help the city maintain its obligations that were signed a long time ago. Can we defer some of it? Can we ask for delays? Or until the studies are done. Seems like everybody's getting some kind of a bailout or some kind of uh, uh, situation where they can postpone things. Why can't we put this off so we can at least get the studies done? It's a question that's come up, and I think uh, the best, maybe, maybe one way to reply to this is we had one of these meetings at the Chamber of Commerce yesterday, and Emory Ford, who's not here tonight, and hopefully he won't be mad at me for taking his. Uh, taking his comment and reiterating it here. But I thought he made a very valid comment that the things that the city needs to do, we need to do because they're the right things to do, not because it's a mandated thing or not because it's someone, you know, holding our foot to the fire saying we need to do this. And his point was, flood control is so old, if we don't take care of that, why, why would we wait for someone to tell us Geez, those engines are 70 years old. You should really do something, and then and then and then and then, and then, and then well, we'll we'll be forced to do it at, at, at their pace. We could at least do it at our pace. Well, and it would take the heat off of you guys to do uh, um, what we these quick fix things that sure. don't last. Sure. I think the I think the point is that uh, you know I mentioned a few minutes ago that Ned Huntley, the director of public works, has been in front of the the mayor for the past 10 years or something, looking for money to do the things that, we're, that still need to be done that we're talking about tonight. So uh, I think the point is that there isn't really money in the general fund to take care of the things that we know that need to be done, R regardless of the Environmental Protection Agency or the Army Corps. These are just things that need to be done. And we're, the city has been unable to find a means to fund these for over a decade. And it's like these little mandates are just the thing that are pushing the city to the breaking point to say, okay, well, the last two years, the city has been talking in earnest about ways to deal with this thing. And I think Terry Colleen, the chair of the Board of Public Works, has been saying at the previous ward meetings that the EPA, they do have something to say. And if you don't comply with the permits that they issue, the fines are like $25,000 a day. So these, these are things that you don't... Can you talk about mitigation on that? See how we're working towards a solution? Can't you fire it in a little bit? So it's not under complete pressure to get it done? Uh, Tony, you, you want to speak that way? Yes, just, uh, your, two, um, two part questions for you. For at least the past five years, there's been a storm with a management fee on every new project. Counting of that money, where that went, how that was used for mitigation of the storm management. Two, what's sort of nervous with me with this project is that you're looking for money for doing some investigation of some very serious systems. The levy system, the pump station, what's the worst case scenario looking at money and then how are we gonna fund that? Is this fee looked at as being a mechanism for funding that? Sure, I'll take the first part of it. Um, <clears throat> we set up fees for stormwater management several years ago. And actually it went into a dedicated fund to pay for a Doug McDonald salary and the existing EPA permit that we had at that point. Well, we found out after about two and a half or three years of doing it, the 
money wasn't steady enough coming in to pay for the program itself. So that reverted back to the general fund. And those How much money was that that was generated? I don't know off the top of my head, Tony, but I gave that information. Okay, it'll be, it'll be I, nice I can't anticipate those. to know how much money has already been collected for the full stormwater management. But that's a small amount of money, right? It's under $50,000. Under, under $50,000. Over the past 10 years? But the program was set up to help mitigate storm water management. It was, and it was and a how has that affected and helped or hindered this program? Because we're looking at now, you're saying another $2 million per year for five years, and then we're still looking at a potential, if those levees aren't seismically correct, <coughs> if that pumping station can't be retrofitted, we're looking at a new pumping station, what are those costs and what are we really looking at here? So the, if I can, I'll, I'll address them. These, these are re really good questions. Can you just speak up a little, please? You're soft-spoken. Thank you. I am. I had a tube removed yesterday. <laughs> I talked to a lot of people. I'm going to lose my stitches. It's going to be pretty. Um, I'll try. Does this help at all this one? No. 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 I'm not sure. I feel better talking into it. <laughs> um, but they're, they're good questions. And I think the money that, that the city was collecting for the stormwater program went toward compliance to the first EPA permit that the city received. The requirements of that permit weren't as onerous as the pending permit that we're anticipating that we'll be seeing. Um, so it was really just toward hiring uh, a professional staff person to develop the report, reporting and the other implementation of programs that the EPA wanted. So in a lot of ways, not a lot of structural things but more accounting and permit compliance stuff. So not a lot of money, but a lot of the city to maintain compliance. The bigger questions that you raise about the status of the flood control station and the levees, there are some unknown costs there, and we don't know what those will be. And I'm not prepared to say tonight how they would be paid. If the city had to replace the, the, pump, the flood control pump station, that could be quite a bit of money. It would be more than $2 million a year to do it, believe me. At that point, the city would need to decide, does it make sense to, uh, to, to bond it through an override, or would it make sense to raise the fee, would it make sense to, to use some combination? Could we go to our delegation and say, you know, geez, the city really needs a hand in replacement. But I think until we find out a little more specifically from the studies how much money we need, it's difficult to say where the money would come from. Sometimes when there's been a lot more push and a lot more emphasis on it, 
And I, and I have to be honest, I think what happens, which usually piques people's interest, I mean, there, is, there'll be lots of discussions, but the first time money is starting to be discussed, what, how much it actually costs. And those conversations were only spoken in terms of like, this is gonna cost us a ton of money in the future, which is what they kept saying. When the point where we're actually discussing a fee was, you know, when people start to get engaged in the conversation for real, that's where they're going, well, wait a minute. And it's appropriate. These are, I mean, this is the way these things play out. And it's, it's our responsibility, which is why we're having these forums, it's our responsibility to, to go to people, stand here to get yelled at from time to time. And, you know, that's why we get paid the big bucks. Because <laughs> we're, we're supposed to, I mean, because we're a representative voice, and we have to understand the concerns, the anger, the frustration that's all associated with this. And then when we have to make a decision, we have to own that decision. And so that's, I mean, I, 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 don't you know, I, I really understand the money issue, but I also understand the citizens. It's like the override. We, we get fed that it's going to cost an average of this, and all of a sudden we're looking at another number. We just want the real, fast, what we're up against. Well, well, and, and, and these guys, I know you know, have a good idea of what another pumping station would be, what the cost for retrofitting that place would be. I, I know you know that. And I think the citizens just deserve that right to have a good feeling and understanding what's five years down the road potentially for this. This isn't just a $66 fee for a first tier house, etc. We're looking at a potential for some real serious money here. And oops. That's, it's, it's that's true. just got to be out. No, and that's true. And in fact, actually, that's the point is that has been out there. And it, 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 it has been out there, you used to yell it to the skies as well. When, when you were working for the city, you, know, you saw what was happening, what was coming, what the potential was. As the state started to reduce its responsibilities, reduce your responsibility through uh, various funding systems, as the federal government continued to reduce it and put more of the onus on the property owner, as opposed to uh, uh, based on the more progressive income tax. We saw all this happening, along with piles of unfunded mandates. And, and just like maintenance of city property, which is going to accumulate over time. Absolutely. It has accumulated, will continue, and will continue to come out. And we're looking at another one on top of this. No. So I think I understand the fear of the citizen really well. We're, excuse the expression, scared. Yeah, we got it. You know? <laughs> But it, and, and, and I think, it, and not to put too fine a point on it, and not to play it down, because actually there is reason to be concerned. There's reason to be freaked out on some level. The fact is, is that we, and in, this has been sort of on our shoulders and it builds. It's like the, it's like the slow boiling the frog. As each, each new mandate comes forward, each responsibility, each fiduciary responsibility manifests and we have to address, or not. And because we're like that pumping station, all stuff flows down to us as the low point. We, speaking about going to Washington, yes, we're going to Washington. Unfortunately, we actually have Washington right in Northampton. Uh, uh, Jim McGovern has his office here. He has our ear. Uh, we have his ear and we've been yelling at it pretty loudly. The, the same thing with, on the state side. To that extent, that's, we continue to lobby for that, but the fact is, is we're still left with a very important and salient feature, which is that we have a looming problem that needs to be addressed because it's actually not just a physical problem, it's a physical problem with the integrity of maintaining our city, the very structure of our city. Aren't you, uh, again. Aren't you uh, by imposing these fees on the businesses, delayed any any kind of economic boom in the city or any kind of research in it? Well, uh, what kind of business would want to come in and pay another twenty thousand or fifteen or twenty thousand to to locate here in Northampton when they can go up to Hatfield and get it for nothing? Well, it, you know, you know, what's part of the you giving people to come here? Well, it's part of the cost. Of First of all, living on the edge of a river, which is why it's Yeah, but I mean, if they go up to one town up, they don't pay that. If we don't 
support this levy system. If that levy system right. fails, if FEMA does not, if FEMA says you don't meet your your uh, our conditions for maintaining a good system, FEMA doesn't insure us. MEMA doesn't insure us. It's fine with you, except every one of those downtown businesses goes into default because their mortgage can't be paid because the no company will insure them, and that and it doesn't impact you perhaps you think. But point of fact, it actually drives the economy in the city. Yeah, but it's, you're doing the same thing, but slower. We'll agree to disagree. <laughs> Barbara. Oh, and actually, you haven't, you've had your hand up a bunch of times. Uh, Josh Brinsey, Glendale Road. Um, I have a large piece of property up on Glendale Road, about an acre and a half. And I got a really long driveway, so I come close to or over the 4,000 square feet. But my whole property slopes away from the road, so none of my water goes into the street. If anything, all my water comes towards my house, all my neighbor's water comes towards my house. It's pretty sandy up there, the water goes right into the ground. Is there going to be a credit for that? Also, I don't think uh, the low income uh, should get a break or the businesses or the large schools and stuff. Especially a place like Smith College. I mean, you build a, a school on the water, you have to expect you're going to have to deal with water problems. And if, if it's in anybody's best interest, it's in theirs to make sure that this problem is taken care of because they're going to be one of the places mostly affected by it. I, I, yeah, I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, I, I think that it, it comes to a philosophical discussion that we're going to have to have on the council floor as to who essentially owns this and what responsibility and who. I mean, you're right. Maybe your contribution to the watershed is nowhere near as significant as others. And, um, you know, there's some people whose water breaks doesn't even come into our watershed, I suspect. And then there's farmers down in the meadows who are actually the deposit ground for that water. If there's an overflow, it all gets discharged into those farms. It's, that's all part of the calculus and the discussion of trying to figure out what's the most equitable way of sharing this burden. And it's a cost, and it's a burden, and it's unique. And we have to figure out the way that makes the most sense that uh, creates the least amount of stress while still realizing the money to realize these these projects that have to be dealt with. I mean, as far as the credits go, that lastingly in a short amount of time is kind of ridiculous because who's going to go out and invest, you know, some people might go and invest thousands of dollars in putting a cistern in the ground to collect the water. So, you know, why am I going to go out and spend five grand to put a tank in the ground to save myself $200 for one year? You know, if, if I'm doing this, it's the long run. So. No, and I think and that's the thing is the mitigation discussion. That has to be had on the council floor. I mean, I, I, what, and with the help of these guys, when we start to figure out what makes sense, what's appropriate, how what, how that should be reflected in the final decision on the fee. And some up front, who has the next chance, and then, then you can go next, because you haven't spoken to me on either side. Hi, Yvonne Keith, I live on Hickory Drive. Um, the Water Sewer Enterprise Fund, uh, I want to shift yours a little bit here. So uh, when they took money out of that this year, they took $2 million, put it in the general fund to stabilize it so we would have a good bond rating. Is that correct? That's what I understood. So when they did that, it looks to me like that's showing a profit in the water sewer enterprise. And we have so much money in there that you can take the $2 million out to put it in the general fund to stabilize the budget, budget to get a good bond rating. So if we have that much money, the water sewer is being taken care of. Is there any way you could consider cutting back our tax on that so that we can pay this fee? That actually happened last year. Said the historic, usual 9% increases that the board of public works and subsequently the city council to pass the budgets. That's been used to pay off some large debt service on the water treatment plant. It was $28.5 million to build that facility. Currently, the enterprise funds both sewer and water have about $60 million in debt service they're paying on each year projects. Uh, the sewer enterprise fund is smaller. It's about $10 million right now. We're actually working on a comprehensive wastewater management plan at this point. And with that, and the board realizes that there's going to be some huge projects coming down to the wastewater treatment plant. The facility is built in, um, I believe, 71 or 72, and it's served its lifespan. And so this report is going to be looking at that. 
So what the board did this past year was they reduced the, I believe it was the sewer down to 2.9%, and I believe the water went to 1% this year, instead of the typical 9%. I don't know if everyone remembers back in 2002, when uh, the federal government forced our hand to build that treatment plant, the water rates went up 23% that year. And the board decided to realize that we can't do this. We need to ratchet this back, but we need to plan for the facility that's going to be built in another four years. And that's what the board has been doing with the Sewer Enterprise Fund, too, is looking at what are we going to do in five years or ten years at this plan to avoid sticker shock to you in eight years from now, also the rates go 30%, 40%, whatever, to pay for a huge cost we incur. Start planning now and managing now for the future. Is the federal government kicking in any money for this project right now? I mean, the Army Corps of Engineers is mandating that it happen no. as well as the EPA. No. Okay, because uh, another thing I'd ask you to look into, because there is a long waiting list, is the Army National Guard help with the dredging at Lick Park to see if there's a part in there you said about dredging around Smith College, the river around there. If you could go ahead and get on the list with them. Maybe it's have to cut some costs, sure. but you need to act quickly because there is a long list. And they do it as a training mission, so it doesn't right. cost anything. So if you could check that out, that would help alleviate some of that. Sure. Thank you. Um, you were next, and then you have a question. Dr. Townsend, Wendell Rose, you mentioned the fairest way to bill us for something that we're going to have to pay one way or another. It's for the good of the city. Our property taxes are billed fairly, fairly, on, uh, fairly on our ability to pay. Our CPA tax is based upon our ability to pay. Why not design it the same as the CPA tax based on property value? You have the cutoff at the bottom already for the CPA, so those people would automatically not have to be billed you could have the IT people put a page two in with the billing of the water and sewer bill, but to give the people a little flexibility, have the stormwater fee bill, give a 60-day uh, time period to pay the bill so people don't have to pay both bills at once. No, and I, and I, I don't think that's a terrible idea, not, but the one thing I would disagree with you on Property tax is not based on your ability to pay. It's based on how much someone values your property, and that's why it's a, not a fair tax. It's a regressive tax. It's not based, you could have bought your house for $65,000 in 1965. It's now assessed at $350,000. There are all those exceptions, no matter which system you use, there's exceptions. Right, so, but, I mean, I think the structure, the fee structure you described, I think that's worth considering. I, I, but I'm only arguing the bigger philosophical point is I think that property taxes is not the proper way to subsidize these things, even though the federal and state governments have decided that they're going to charge less in income tax and let the property owner pick it up. And I think ultimately, just philosophically speaking, I think that's unfair. It was also mentioned, not tonight, but so hiring more city workers to run this new program, whereas if the IT people could build it in to an existing building system that we already have, will be automatic, and you won't need to hire more people. No, you're still going to have to hire more people. No, I'm Jim Ryan. I get out the property. I'm hiring here also. I live in Leeds, but I couldn't go to my own ward meeting, so I came here tonight. Number one, the Mill River and the Mack River, we drained into a reef. Why haven't you gone to, to the feds and said, this is not just our problem. We take water from Williamsburg, Cummington, Goshen. We take water from all the way up to the whole Connecticut River. Why hasn't someone gone to the Army Corps of Engineers, per the agreement from 1938, which Mr. Quiker, the mayor, signed then, and say, we're here to maintain. We're not here to do your, your engineering studies. We're here to maintain. Have we done a good job of maintaining? We've done the best we can, because what has happened to the DPW? It's lost probably a third of their workforce in the last 20 years. And the city council allows that to happen. You can't keep cutting these guys right here who are trying to do the work that probably 100 people need to do, and they only have 60. It's impossible. Oh, but that actually part of the first point. The second point, I would say that 
you know, back to my original point, in the last 10 years, we've lost $35 million worth of state units. $35 million up to this community alone. The city council, for the most part, yeah, we, uh, we approve the budget that the mayor lays out. The mayor lays the budget out based on, on proportional need, theoretically. And then you can argue with the priorities that they have. But point of fact, actually, it, it, it is, we find the frustration of being in the city council is this is an untenable situation. It's, it's what we all face in our homes, too. The same thing, less to pay for more, uh, more demands, more requirements, more mandates. It's the same thing. It's like, how do you do triage? And that's what essentially being a city council is, for the most part, is doing triage. And, and I don't know, if we, you know, I don't know how elegant well we've done it, but I, I, I wouldn't say that we've done a really good job. But I, by the same token, it's not from uh, lack of trying and understanding. And then, do you want to speak to the, the federal commitment and understand the need? What is the federal's obligation? Because, as everyone points out, we're part of a larger watershed. We yeah. are. And, and, and the why are we carrying the entire burden of, of, for, of the watershed? We carry some of the burden. Obviously, the Mill River Diversion Channel is taking water from local hill towns also. Oh, yeah. Connecticut River receives that. Yeah. We don't see West Springfield asking Northampton to help out with their flood control system because we're putting our water downstream also. But the Mill River is a is a pretty sound system. It's, it doesn't have a pump station attached to it. And the reason we have that pump station is because we need to pump the water out of the city to the downtown area. If um, you know if downtown was higher, or people didn't build that, we wouldn't worry about this system. But we have to. But no, no one's gone to Williamsburg or Conway or Waitley and said, hey, can you give us, you know, $50,000? I'm not saying go to this one. If you approach it to the fence, that this is just not Northampton that's dumping water from the Mill River. It's this whole area. We're at the, the bottom of the bowl. Like where I live on Chesterfield Road, mm -hmm. if I didn't put the, the city in and put the berm in there, all the water would be in my lot. If we do the same thing, if you're at the bottom of the bowl and you say, look, this whole area is sheds here, why aren't you helping us do this? So the okay. feds, not just us. So philosophically, I think you make a very good point. From the Army Corps' standpoint, they just tell the city, you need to maintain the protections for your city. They don't actually tell us how to pay for it. And, and I think your point is, well, the water's coming from a lot of other towns, we should extend the need to get revenue as far as we can, but the feds don't actually instruct the city how to pay for it. They actually don't care. They just say, we're not going to pay for it for you. You need to figure out what to do. So under, under the Mass General Laws, the city of Northampton actually has no ability to incur a fee on other communities that don't well, want it. That's why the federal government's got to come. You have to go to them and say, look, we drain for a lot of people. We're you designed the system. You put us in, you maybe go around. When we get to that certain level, it's going to flood us. Why aren't you doing so? Like that 1.2 million, which was on the first page, which was for maintenance and engineering studies. Why aren't they paying for the engineering studies? They have an Army Corps of Engineers here to say, here, you do it. No, you do it. You designed it. Just a side point. It would be really interesting to know back in 1938 or 39 if the mayor and the city council actually had those conversations with the Army Corps. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I wasn't alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just have two points. Um, my name is Patty Healy, and I live on Long Pellow Drive, and I live on a hill. So, you know, the rest of here can drown, and, but I'll be up there on my hill, but that's not really the way I think about it. I, I live in terror of a flood. I mean, I know the nurses who worked in the New York hospitals when New York City flooded. Now, you can say, oh, it's not going to happen here, but we don't know when a disaster is going to hit. And I think disaster preparedness is very important. And I think the city council is, like, trapped. They're between a rock and a hard place. they got to do this, because the feds are saying, no money, we got to do it. They've set up the system, and we don't like it. We don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like the whole, you know, <laughs> this one's going to pay this much and this one's going to pay that much. Frankly, I'm not going to have to pay too much, you know. The one thing that I'm happy about, though, is that the nonprofits have to pay. And when I saw that graph up there, property tax, how much we're all paying, the proposal on this fee, which, granted, we don't want to pay it. We don't want it. We've got we to have to do it. We're paying it. We're, we're getting this happens and the city council votes 
touched on it, we're going to get money out of those nonprofits. They have to pay too. And I think, the, you know, for me, I'm looking at this like, I don't want a town to flood. I don't want my neighbors to, to float away. I don't want to pay for this, but we have to. But at least everybody is going to pay under this, this proposal. That's all. You've been waiting very patiently. Okay. Um, I, and I don't want to downplay the teachers, the firemen, or the policemen, but we voted for our overall, and they all kept their jobs, which was very, very good. I mean, we, we need our, our teachers, firemen, and, and policemen. But now, since we've done that, we've added more people um, to the teachers, firemen, and, and policemen. I mean, what's going to happen if this all gets passed? Are we going to have more and more money added on to this, our flood control and so forth? Is that going to keep happening? Well, that's, I, I, that, you know, I that's, that's, I think, what Tony was asking, too. Okay, can I have sure. one more thing? I mean, we have lived here all our lives, and we go up and down Rain Road, you know, three or four or five times a week. And other people must that have been in this ward. Have you looked to see how many houses are for sale? Because people are fed up with paying more and more and more. And then, I mean, like one of the houses we just saw that so people from Connecticut bought it. Wait until they find out what's going on. They're not going to be happy. And and I mean, us, we're looking to move to northern Vermont. I mean, we just we you know we can move to northern Vermont, get nine acres of land with a five bedroom three and a half baths for two hundred and ninety nine thousand dollars. Nineteen hundred dollars a year in taxes. I mean that for us being senior citizens, that sounds good to us. Well you know it's it goes I mean we have to leave our families, but it sounds good. It goes back to my frustration and all of our frustration I think with the experience we just experience in different ways in some sense. With putting the onus on property owners. Um, but that, that is the larger discussion. And, and, you know, as counselors, we don't have a lot of authority in the state. We don't get this, we do scream at the state. In fact, we've done a number of resolutions. We've gone to lobby Boston. We've, uh, we've met, Peter Colcott knows this full well, and he actually is on the side of it. He actually has proposed over and over in the western part of the state, actually carries a lot of burden for Boston. And the, you know, historically over time, Politicians wanted to reduce income tax with the theory being that it would stimulate growth and then offset all these other issues that were described. That didn't quite pan out. But the, consequently, uh, people look at income tax differently than look at property tax. But property taxes are particularly burdensome because, as I said, it doesn't have any, it has no relevance to how what you can afford. It drives people out of communities. And this isn't unique to Northampton. In fact, actually, if you saw the Gazette had an article just recently, the western part of the state is going to lose the most significant amount of population. The reason we lost a congressman was because the western part of the state, people left for these same pressures. And your frustration is, I know it and realize and experience it myself personally. It's the same thing. This is part of the fight. It's not the fights. These are actually the struggles that we have in the council as well. So what we, I mean, our job is to take the case to Boston and beyond, uh, but then at the same time recognize that we have responsibilities here on the ground. And, and we can't pretend, uh, uh, being ticked off isn't enough, unfortunately. Being ticked off isn't going to stop the rain from falling, isn't going to stop the pressures on the stormwater system. So we have to actually make very, very difficult decisions. And the reason we have these discussions is that we better do it with a full breadth and understanding of the pain that it actually exacts on the people that we're asking to help carry the burden. So uh, that's not an answer, I realize. <laughs> uh, me, uh, I grew up in Amherst, so I'm more familiar with Amherst. And only three You're forgiven. Yeah, I know. Forgiven. Only three people that I know grew up there. So it happens. People grew up in Amherst. But, uh, but, uh, uh, the town of Amherst receives funds from UMass in lieu of taxes. Do we have the same system with the They receive funds. They don't. You're describing what's called a pilot, a payment yeah. in lieu of taxes. Yeah. 
And in fact, actually, Councilor Adams has been pushing for that rather hard as Councilor Labarges as well in discussion. Uh, UMass doesn't actually, UMass pays into certain systems that right. they utilize. Smith, on the other hand, the same thing. They paid for a fire truck for it. Uh, and I think that's fine. It's, it's nice, except the fact is I don't get to pick and choose what items right. I want to buy right. when I pay my taxes. But that's, listen, the federal and state enabling law allows them not to pay a damn thing. Right. So there are discussions. There's a new president at Smith. Uh, the mayor has expressed a profound and keen interest on in trying to get some more investment from Smith that we can use as our discretionary money, not Smith's discretionary money. So that, yeah, believe me, it's being considered. It also, Amherst enjoys some more leverage in the fact that it's a state, UMass is a state entity. They don't share that same kind of uh, cooperation from Amherst College or from Hampshire College. Which is so important. Uh, who hasn't spoken yet? That answer, man. Um, my name's Chris Hellman. I'm actually from Ward 2, but the reason I'm here tonight is because, like Michael, I'm a member of the Board of Hope Works, and I also serve on the uh, stormwater task force. Um, so I, I come to these forums to get as much feedback as we're still in discussion. And I heard a lot of really interesting comments tonight. There are only two points that I want to make. The first one is, and I'm just telling you he's still here, um, the mandate of the task force, we talked about $2 million a year and what it's going to cost and how much it's all going to be. We didn't really go into it with that. Our, the mandate the task force got from the city council was, was really quite narrow. What, what we were told to do was come up with uh, a system of paying for upcoming expenses that we would consider to be fair and equitable. And that was it. There really wasn't a budget in mind. So when we talk about how much is it going to cost, that wasn't really a decision factor. I think the way Mike phrased it when he did his thing, when he did his presentation is, the numbers that you see here are based on a $2 million a year budget. The city council, with guidance from the Department of Public Works and the Board of Public Works, will at some point set this rate based on what it, I mean, it could be 1.5 million. What we know is it won't be more than 2 million because that's part of the statute that we've included. But it, 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 it's a sliding scale, and it's going to be based on the amount of work that we're going to do. Um, the second point I want to discuss is, is the role of Smith College in all this, um, because we thought that that was actually a pretty important discussion. And Smith was actually represented on the task force. Um, I think one of the things that, and, and one of the reasons that we knew right off the bat that we were going to go to a fee structure rather than funding it through the general fund was we wanted to include the big nonprofits. And Smith is obviously the biggest one. You saw there at the top of the food chain when it comes to what they were going to pay. Um, I think one of the things, and uh, unfortunately he left, but the point he made was that if you're going to build your house on a river, you ought to expect a flood um, with regard to Smith's location on the Mill River. One of the things that Smith does and takes very little credit for, gets no credit for, is they actually invest in that portion of the river that flows through their campus. And in fact, they just put I believe it was $800,000 into um, uh, repairing riprap on, on, the, on the Paradise Pond. And they're going to be doing a, um, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, but they're basically going to build an underground tunnel to funnel under water through Paradise Pond so it will move through, they can regulate the flow more, more quickly. So um, one of the things that I think we need to keep in mind is that even though they don't pay taxes with regard to the stormwater thing, they're going to take a huge hit, and they already do make a contribution. Obviously, it's in their own best interest to do so, but it is part of the whole mitigation issue. And I think that that's another component that, as Bill pointed out, um, there, are there are good reasons to do this other than um, we're being forced to do it. It's, it's you know. Um, I'm holding off on my rain garden until the credit system is in place because, because I think that it's something that I want to do, but if I can get a credit for it as well, heck, I'm going to take it. So anyhow, um, you can find me um, through the uh, Board of Public Works website if you want to. Um, I'm more than happy to talk about this at, at any length with anybody. So. I do need to follow up though. I would like to say that Northampton is a community that is really based on community. And it is known to always come through and do the right thing. The problem that I see here as residents is we're going to be imposed a fee. 
and it's another tax, and we don't know how long it's going to be. And we have all this information that doesn't give us any real specifics. We have a city who historically, not now, not maybe when Marianne was elected in, but historically was so fiscally frugal, it was ridiculous. And we're sitting here saying, well, they're gonna, they have to do these repairs. Are we gonna be pouring money into an obsolete system? Does it need to be replaced? We just wanna know that you people are on board to be really fiscally responsible. And Yvonne's right, there are resources out there from the National Guard, Westover has engineers out there that will do community service stuff. And we should be trying to pull those things in. We should be trying to look to, to delay some of the cost to the residents. And you know, there's there's a house across from us that's up for rent because they can't even sell it on Ryan Road. So this, as a resident, these are the things that we take to mind. And I think one of the problems is is we don't have the studies done, so we don't have good information. And if you guys could get us some more good information, if that city council can go out and start looking at resources or get another you know, uh, ad hoc committee or something to go out and look at, at, you know, the Army Corps engineers, the National Guard, Westover, and see if we couldn't put some things in place. It'd be really helpful. I think that's what the residents are looking for. The, um, part of all the, the things that you described were actually being done and have been done. It's what Doug does. It's, it's what Jim does. They, it's what Ned does. They've actually, they, they, um, they pursue every grant pursue every, you know, every means by which we can reduce the cost that's going to be borne by this. And, and, and I think you said quite eloquently that, that clearly we're being presented with a problem that, and the frustration comes from, um, it's a problem that we have little control over. Uh, we can change the course of water as it goes down a stream. But the fact is, is that, and just as this gentleman said who left, when you build near a river, you actually have to expect that you're going to have to deal with some of the issues. We built near a river. It's what this city is. It's what actually defines the city in many ways. And it also presents us with some problems, some unique problems. But problems, Holyoke experiences, Chicopee where Westover is, Chicopee same thing. Everyone, the reason we all built near rivers is because they're a resource. But with that, and we don't actually exploit that resource anymore. Um, we, uh, neither does Hoyo, but we're not going to pick up and move. But, what's that? Westover has done an awful lot for Chicopee. Yes, oh, no argument there. I mean, they've done quite well. It's, yeah, no, no, it, it, that's absolutely. I, I'm, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Okay. <laughs> it's the elephant in the room. You're coming at us for all this more money after just giving us a two and a half override that most of us didn't want. Mm -hmm. When's the next one coming? Because we know in a week or two down the road, you're going to have to come and say, we have to replace the barn at DPW. That's going to cost how much money? Because it's 100, what, 25 years old? And one good snowstorm, the roof's going to fall in. And another good example of neglect of pro proper you know, preventive maintenance. When's that going to happen? <coughs> And how many times can you keep coming back to the well? It's almost dry. Well, it's, I, and, I, and you get no argument from me. I, don't, I mean, I think the thing is, is that all these costs and associated costs and burdens, will, they don't end tonight. They don't end with this fee. They don't end with the last override. They don't end with the last ta next tax cycle. It's an ongoing, and it, the, the only thing that you can tr we can try and do is try and at least share the burden more fairly throughout the country, per person. But and it, but the fact is that I that I don't have any control over what happens in the country. I barely have any control of what happens in my house. And that, and in the but the fact is is that I'm not going to blow smoke anywhere. Telling someone that suddenly, you know, this, the, right after this next snowstorm, the suns are going to come out and unicorns are going to graze on the lawns and everything's going to be fine. It's not. It's not. The, all these things are systems that we built, and the law of entropy has all these pressures. These things will start falling apart. 
And that comes down to the discussion that you also heard here tonight, is the issue of deferred maintenance. When every time there's budget pressures, what happens is maintenance is the first thing that gets deferred. It's, and there are consequences to that. But it's also much harder to make a political case to somebody, and this is what these guys are asking for right now, is a, 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 you know, no longer to defer maintenance, but an ongoing maintenance system that will maintain integrity as opposed to a one-hit fix, which Tony described as possibly happening going down the road. And I, I think philosophically it's appropriate to commit to these projects and pay for them over time and maintain them properly. But, for instance, when you come to ask for an override, you're not asking for maintenance. People won't vote for that. They'll vote, for the most part, actually the biggest override passage was the rebuilding of the high school, which is 75% of the community voted for that. It was a bricks and mortar uh, system that had a finite end to the, to the debt. But the problem is, the reason we had to rebuild the high school, in large part, was because of deferred maintenance. There was a big cost at the end of the at the end of the thing. So it, again, it's it's budgetary philosophy that comes down. So when's the next override? I don't know. The, I know that we worked very hard, and the mayor worked very hard to make sure that, that we don't even consider an override in four years for four years. So that that was built into this last override. The override structure, and this will be my last point on this. Proposition two and a half was built to fail. It was designed to fail. It's called two and a half because it was only going to attach two and a half percent increase, knowing that the rate of inflation, the cost of living, was three percent on average. They knew the idea was, and this was the whole part of the debate, because once upon a time, city councils and mayors could just say, well, we need to do this, so we'll just tax more. They set up a system so that the city would have to go and ask the citizens, is this a worthwhile investment each time? And they would vote in, in, and the majority would decide whether it was an appropriate expenditure of funds. Somehow, now Proposition 2.5 is considered to be a failure. If you're doing an override, that's an expression of failure of, of bad fiduciary management. But point of fact, actually, we rate very highly in fiduciary management. We got a great uh, bond rating as a result. But the, that doesn't matter because, as you said, when it comes home, when it's, what it counts is when you go home and you open up the envelope that's got the bill that says how much you got to pay and what that means to you. And so that's where the huge disconnect has always occurred. It's where I think arguably the council has failed in some point, uh, trying to at least express that candidly and clearly. And but I so the short answer is. With every hope in every fiber of my being, I hope we never have to ask for another override, but I don't think we'll see one for at least four years for uh, fiscal management. And if the economy grows and improves and we actually start to realize some more revenue, maybe longer. Bill, you should talk about Pamela Schwartz. She said that meeting coming up with the community. Um, yes. Oh, well, well yeah. Pamela Schwartz is actually wants to is asking for the community to get engaged in a conversation to take it to Boston to require and call for a more progressive pack, a tax based on income as opposed to based on property. Right. To okay. take the onus off the property tax owners. So if you want more information about that, we can get that for you. John. Yeah, I think what everybody's described is a philosophy called the Tebow effect. Tebow was a planner. And he had worked on this back in the 50s and discovered that, sure enough, the municipality continues to raise taxes and fees on the residents, the long-term residents. Sooner or later, those residents are going to decide it's time to pick up and right. leave because they can no longer afford to live in that town and city. Right. So that's a, an effect that's been around for a long time. It has been, it, and it, it's what creates gentrification, it's what creates gated yeah. communities and things like that. But on a different note, a little earlier, we were talking about, I'm, I'm kind of curious, how the rationale for limiting the uh, acreage to just one acre, if, if, for example, someone owns 27 acres of land, I think was the example somebody used, why is it we're just taxing them on, or feeing them on, on the, in the formula on the one acre? I think that was a, a decision of a task force, 
And the, the way they, the reason they made that decision was because if you have a large, if you own, say you own 50 acres of land, if you don't limit it to some small amount, the people with the largest pieces of land that are undeveloped would get the largest bills. And I think the task force felt that that wasn't fair and that it was more important to have more of the fee related to the amount of impervious area. So if you're a car dealership or a large business that has a large parking lot and you're making money and you're having the most impact on the stormwater system, your fee should be the highest, not the person that owns 50 acres of land in, in Florence. They just felt like that wasn't, that wasn't fair. And so they decided to shrink that to one acre. And when they looked at the, the table of the bills, they felt that it was fair and they voted to approve that. is just a little bit more than probably one kid's scholarship. I think when you get down to the fees, they actually are pretty fair. I mean, they're not going to bankrupt us. I think the problem is, again, it's, it's another tax that's going to be on for we don't know how long. And that's, that's what's not feeling good, because when you get a two and a half override, it's two and a half forever. Now we got fees coming on that sound like they're going to be there forever, and two million sounds like a lot a year and we don't have any clue of really how it's going to be spent because we haven't got the studies done yet. Well, and as you pointed out, the cost of this, and as you played out, cost is to develop the studies and review and analyze what it is that needs to be addressed. So, so we can keep discussions priority. going. Right, but I mean, and, and the thing is, is that if we don't establish this, they don't get that money to do those studies. It's, you know, it's, but yeah, I got your point. Are there, uh, are there any other questions? I mean, I'll stay until you want me to go and, or you kick me out, but I, these guys are actually on the clock. So if you have actually any other questions, you might. Yeah, Mike's not, but he. Yes, ma'am. Double time or time and a half? My name is Pat Newman, and I live on 521 West Roads. I want to thank all of you for doing this tonight. My name is Jim Sip sitting here, and I think it's all Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to ask you something. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, I'll stick around if anyone wants to talk with me as well. So.